Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome those who are here in person and those who are online, watching, uh, streaming, as well as record it later. Uh, let's get started here. My name is Meng Chiang. I'm the uh, Executive Vice President uh, for Strategic Initiatives at Purdue University and the uh, John A. Everson Dean of College of Engineering. Uh, we started uh, last month, and this is the second installment of a new series at Purdue called the Ambassadors Distinguished Lecturers, inviting ambassadors, former and current uh, ones, and other uh, high-level uh, leaders in the foreign policy to come to Purdue in person uh, to give uh, hybrid lectures. And today, it is a huge honor and distinct pleasure for me to introduce the Ambassador Distinguished Lecturer, uh, Bonnie Glick. And I'm going to have to make this very short introduction, but uh, Bonnie is, uh, well, one of us here in the Midwest. Uh, she grew up uh, near where we are in West Lafayette, Indiana today, and still has family roots here in Indiana. And she is the inaugural director of the new Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. It is a think tank as part of Purdue Research Foundation focusing on the intersection between U.S. foreign policy and emergent technology. And prior to this, uh, Bonnie was the deputy administrator and the highest Senate-confirmed leader uh, at the USAID, United States Agency for International Development, the largest, most impactful charity organization in human history. And uh, uh, Bonnie was confirmed unanimously in the Senate uh, to assume this important role and she's uh, been a long time leader as a career diplomat, as an executive at IBM in semiconductor industry, and now uh, a leader for the country, the world, and right here at Purdue. A big welcome to Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dean Cheng. And congratulations to all of you here on this new lecture series. Good afternoon to all of you, whether you're here in person at the Kroc Leadership Center or you're watching us online. It's an absolute pleasure to speak with you here today in what is, I am sure, the highlight of my week here at Purdue. First of all, I wanna thank Purdue's leadership faculty and students for the warm Midwestern welcome that I receive every time I come here. Becoming part of the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue feels like coming home. Now, if the winter here is anything like the winters where I grew up in Chicago, I'm not sure I'll be saying the same thing. That remains to be seen. For now, it's simply a delight to be here amid the burst of fall colors and the buzz of activity on campus. I wanna to talk to you today about tech diplomacy. Those are two words you don't often hear paired together. So what exactly does tech diplomacy mean and why does it have anything to do with Purdue? For America, tech diplomacy is a brand new approach to foreign policy, an emerging category in the toolkits of foreign policymakers. Sorry. and it's designed to address 21st century challenges. Over the past decade, we've witnessed global threats to the United States and to our allies that have come at us through an array of advanced technologies. Think about it. Cyber attacks, strange and unexplained high-frequency targeting of American embassy employees in countries like Cuba, China, and Russia, the use of artificial intelligence and facial recognition that has targeted opposition groups or individuals. Corruption of internet tools that were designed to promote democracy, but that instead have been used to turn democracy on its head through bots and disinformation. And most recently, of course, the coronavirus, a complex disease that has changed the way that we work, interact, learn, travel, and live our daily lives. 
And we believe the answer to addressing these threats and emerging ones that we don't even know anything about yet lies in harnessing the ingenuity and innovation of technological advancements invented here in the United States and in allied countries. 21st century challenges require 21st century solutions, and tech diplomacy is on the front lines. Of course, American and allied diplomats must still be lovers of foreign languages and able to speak across cultural divides. But in the 21st century, those representing America and like-minded countries abroad must also be fluent in the language of technology, microelectronics, 6G, hypersonics, AI, quantum computing, synthetic biology, semiconductors, ag tech, fintech, rare earth elements, critical minerals, batteries, and so much more are equally as important as speaking Spanish or Arabic or Russian. Reaching such technological fluency will result in better partnering with allied countries as we strive to reconfigure our supply chains and the global supply chains. We're looking for new ways to manufacture and distribute goods around the world. We all saw what happened at the start of the COVID pandemic when there was something akin to the Hunger Games in the search for personally protective equipment. It led those of us in government to start a conversation about the global supply chain in a way that hadn't been considered before. We started talking about the need to onshore, nearshore, and allied shore production and distribution. Tech diplomacy will not replace things like arms control or trade negotiations, but it will enhance and complement the existing democratic discussions around diplomacy. Technology is a great tool in the foreign policymakers toolkit, absolutely, but she also has to be able to use this critically and in an important way to advance freedom. Facial recognition is a great thing, right? You can use it to unlock your iPhone. It can be deployed to ensure identity for a variety of security systems. But what about when an authoritarian regime deploys facial recognition to identify dissidents? AI is pretty cool, right? Artificial intelligence is used to build algorithms that can then predict what someone's going to do. That's great and convenient when Google Docs wants to help you complete a sentence for a paper that you're writing. But what about when information related to your search history or your mailbox or your shopping history or the books that you take out of a library is hijacked by an authoritarian regime? to spy on you and your family, and even used to detain you on charges of sedition or treason. These are real examples. Technology can be an enormous enabler. It can also be turned on its head and used for suppression of speech or assembly or religion. These are all freedoms that we hold dear in the United States. Indeed, they are enshrined in the First Amendment to our Constitution, which guarantees them. But in dictatorships in countries like the People's Republic of China, Venezuela, Russia, Burma, or Syria, technology is used to target individuals and groups to curtail their basic freedoms of speech, assembly, and religion. Policymakers in government and senior leaders in the tech industry are aware of these types of suppression, but it's hard to stop them. In the US, we have developed tools that were designed to make the world more democratic. Tools like the internet were decidedly left open for anyone to access anyone to use, and it too has been turned on its head and used in subversive ways. Artificial intelligence was developed as a way to make the information on the internet more digestible, more indexed, so that people like doctors could take advantage of all the information available on every disease on earth and developed more tailored treatment plans for patients. 
It was developed so that retailers could keep track of stock on hand in a store and reorder as needed to maintain customer satisfaction. It was not designed to predict an individual's planned next steps. That's making the matrix feel a little bit too real. Only, I have to say, move over, Neo, because on many levels, the matrix is real. In countries like China, where the combination of AI, facial recognition, and ubiquitous cameras are a reality, add to that the Chinese Communist Party's hunger for data, personal data, corporate data, national security data from other countries, and you have the makings of a witch's brew of authoritarianism. Technology must advance freedom. And at the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue, we are essential to this mission. At the Center for Tech Diplomacy, the country's first tech tank, we deal with these cutting edge diplomatic concerns of the 21st century in an emerging field that I like to call techno statecraft. And we chose to set up shop right here at Purdue. So why Purdue? Not only does Purdue boast world-class technology programs across all of the colleges with an administration and faculty and student body ready and eager to meet 21st century challenges. But as I like to say, in Washington, D.C., and in the national political environment that's divided between blue and red and between east and west, Indiana is a little bit like Switzerland because you understand that technology diplomacy is too consequential to let partisanship or geography get in the way. The university provides a neutral and independent space to cultivate relations between policymakers, industry, and the nation's top innovators. And as students at Purdue, you have front row seats to this cutting edge diplomatic tool that's being propelled right here on campus. Not only do you have front row seats, but audience participation is encouraged. So now that I've explained the basics of tech diplomacy, and although I'm so excited to be with you here today in West Lafayette, we're going to take a little field trip around the world. Here at Purdue, you're among the country's most creative and innovative leaders. And it will be able to, we'll be able to take this journey, this imaginary journey, without passports with ease. I don't have any doubt of that. But first, let's paint the backdrop for this trip. The challenges that we face if we're to make the 21st century the second American century are real. Malign forces around the world feel emboldened to both assert their power abroad and increasingly to stifle dissent at home. At the moment, Iran races toward a nuclear weapon. Russia continues age-old tricks against the sovereignty of countries in its neighborhood. Afghanistan, once again, becomes a home for global jihad. And of course, China not only threatens its neighbors and terrorizes its citizens through a campaign of genocide, but openly and happily challenges the liberal democratic order, taking aim at the liberties and values that we so cherish and that we know to be inalienable. Nonetheless, you here in the audience today, here in West Lafayette and on the internet, Know that the United States, in this country, we do not despair, we innovate. The key to the second American century lies in facilities just like the one we're gathered in today. It's the never-ending desire of free nations and free people to innovate, advance, rise to the occasion of new challenges, and work with our friends and allies to export this ingenuity around the world. It's institutions like Purdue, home to the new Center for Tech Diplomacy, and the people who teach at it, conduct research through it, and study in it, which rightfully energizes and sustains us. But technological advancement alone is not enough. 
It's the intersection of technological innovation and diplomacy with an appreciation for human rights, freedom, and economic growth that the United States and its allies should be focused on in the 21st century. There's an old saying, particularly used here in the Midwest, that goes something like, good neighbors make good fences. Well, when you really think about it, isn't that what international relations is all about? I mean, we take it for granted here in the United States. We're so lucky to have friendly relations with our neighbors to the north and to the south. We're blessed by natural geography. It's a luxury that many countries in the world are not afforded. And this is where technology diplomacy comes into play. We believe that technology and innovation offer the critical resources necessary to foster good relations and good fences. And in some regions of the world, we can start with the Indo-Pacific, hostile actors actively threaten and intimidate their neighbors. Yes, I'm talking about the People's Republic of China, but China's neighbors, in examples I'll soon illustrate, have found an antidote to these types of hostilities, tech diplomacy. So while not every country is blessed with good fences, they can build them, chain by chain, link by link, at the intersection of technology and diplomacy. And that's our specialty at the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. We know that technological innovation and national interests are inextricably linked and we strive to build on the growing recognition that 21st century technology must be used to advance human freedom. In fact, critical technologies, when they're used correctly and employed strategically, pose an unprecedented opportunity to advance human rights and ensure security. But we also recognize that our friends and allies must play a central role in this venture, and that's where diplomacy comes into play. With that in mind, pull out your virtual passports, and we can return to the field trip that I promised. I hope you prepared yourselves, because we're about to embark on a journey through every part of the world for an up-close look at the fruits of technology diplomacy in the 21st century. We'll start in the Indo-Pacific, a region we all probably think of when technology and innovation come to mind. As you well know, countries in the Indo-Pacific are not so blessed with good neighbors, but through ingenuity, innovation, and techno-statecraft, countries in the Indo-Pacific region are building good fences. Let's take the example of the semiconductor industry. A single semiconductor, which can be smaller than the width of a strand of hair, depends on rare earth elements, a crucial component in its creation. And there are billions of semiconductors in devices that we depend on every day, like our smartphones. China currently dominates the global supply of rare earth elements with control of upwards of 80% of the processed elements. In recent years, coming to a head during COVID, China has imposed limits on its export of rare earth elements. As you can imagine, these limitations drive up global prices and force other countries to exploit their own resources to supply their own or allied countries. So what did China's neighbors do? They used technology diplomacy to ensure that their allies retained access to rare earth elements used in semiconductor manufacturing. Japan and Vietnam partnered a little over 10 years ago to launch a joint research center in Hanoi, Vietnam, to improve extraction and processing of rare earth elements. In addition to this action by the Japanese government, Japanese companies made moves to mine rare earth elements in other countries in Asia and across the Indo-Pacific, including Kazakhstan, India, and Australia. 
This is an instructive example of tech diplomacy with both the free market and government recognizing Japan's economic dependence on certain rare earth elements, collaborating with allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region to gain access to these elements and establishing a sturdy fence to solve a 21st century challenge. And the story continues into Taiwan, where Taiwan demonstrates its values as a democratic nation and its innovation as one of the world's major manufacturers of semiconductors. Taiwan lives and breathes techno-statecraft every day, even in the face of the increasingly threatening moves to counter it by the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party. Elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific, tech diplomacy is playing out through the manufacture of batteries. Now, many of us, when we think about batteries, we envision those AA or AAA batteries that are found in small electronic devices. Those things are a little bit bigger than a semiconductor and that we are terribly reliant on them. But I'm actually thinking of the enormous batteries that power electric vehicles or store energy generated through alternative power sources like wind or solar. I love driving into West Lafayette and passing by massive wind farms and solar farms on the way in. All that clean energy is stored in massive batteries. Thailand and Indonesia are building battery production facilities, providing materials to large manufacturers in the region. And then Indo-Pacific companies like the Korean company Hyundai are utilizing tech diplomacy in the region to build new plants in Indonesia and Vietnam, as well as investing in R&D production in Singapore. Up and down the Indo-Pacific region, Tech diplomacy is instrumental in erecting solid fences to counter a sometimes unfriendly neighbor. Now let's move to the Middle East, where the three countries making headlines for brokering peace over the past year, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, have placed technology at the center of their diplomatic strategy toward each other. Israel, of course, is known as the startup nation, known for bringing water to the desert, engineering the personal navigator ways, and boasting over 6,000 active startups in a country the size of New Jersey. The startup nation, Israel, is partnering with you, the United Arab Emirates, which now calls itself the scale-up nation. And it's partnering with the UAE as a leader among Arab nations in digital transformation and smart cities, which provides a leading market for the export of Israeli technologies in the Middle East. Meanwhile, the UAE can pivot to deep technology, an Israeli specialty, in areas like cybersecurity, AI, and blockchain with the help of the startup nation. And then there's Bahrain, which has begun to call itself the pilot nation, which is partnering with an Israeli water company to find innovative solutions to the country's water, water shortages, and with fintech companies, as Bahrain is a financial center in the Arab world. In the Middle East, water conservation and innovation, green technologies, digital transformation, and deep tech are driving peace in the region. That's technology diplomacy in action. The UAE, Bahrain, and Israel are constructing fences in the region, paving the way for other neighbors to join in. Other recent signatories to peace agreements include Morocco and Sudan. Morocco, too, is looking at technology through the lens of entrepreneurship and turning to Israel to share some of the innovation of its tech entrepreneurship ecosystem. Sudan has hit a snag, and we're all watching closely to see what happens as the result of the recent military coup d'etat. Stay tuned. Share your thoughts and prayers, please, with the people of Sudan. Next, let's look at Africa, where financial technology, FinTech, innovations are propelling growth and development across the continent. 
Growing investments in cellular and internet structures throughout Africa, driven by countries, companies such as Finland's Nokia and Sweden's Ericsson, provide opportunities for emerging digital payment platforms, banking, insurance, and lending services. Look at M-Pesa if you've heard of it. It was launched in Kenya in the early 2000s, and it connects people previously cut out of the financial system with access to money and banking at the touch of a finger. They don't even need a smartphone. They can use it on a standard cell phone. In fact, M-Pesa reached 50 million active users across Africa so far this year from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to Egypt, to Ghana, to Tanzania, innovations in technology are driving development and connectedness, making tech diplomacy all the more relevant to the region. Also in Africa, innovations in green and renewable energy aim to meet the continent's vast energy needs, pioneered through tech diplomacy, through, uh, through the likes of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group, a Japanese company partnering with the local Kenyan utility company, a public sector company called Kengen, to provide steam turbines for geothermal uh, power plants in the country. And lastly, let's return to our own hemisphere, where countries throughout Latin America have recognized the essential role that technology plays in 21st century diplomacy. In 2020, Colombia created the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, which has prioritized strengthening relations in these fields with its neighbors in Brazil, Panama, and Peru. Meanwhile, Colombian technology startup companies like Rapi, a, a delivery app providing fintech services, are increasing investments and diversifying their operations into Brazil. That's an example of tech diplomacy enabling good neighbors to make good fences, literally. So let's recap what we witnessed on this trip around the world. From renewable energy in Africa, to fintech in Latin America, to technology sharing, propelling peace in the Middle East, and the backbone of it all, semiconductor manufacturing in the Indo-Pacific, technology stands at the cutting edge of diplomacy in the 21st century. All across the world, hostile neighbors are being countered through the utilization of techno-statecraft. In real time, we're witnessing a transformation in the art of diplomacy as country by country, chain by chain, link by link, good fences are going up around the globe, all because they've chosen to bring technology into play. We Americans say good neighbors make good fences, and in the 21st century, neighborly relations are forged through tech diplomacy. So now we're back in Indiana, and this is where the real excitement begins. I want to thank you all so much for your attention today. I know that I'm the one thing standing between you and pizza, so don't kill me, but maybe we can uh, have some time for a few questions. As you can hear from my accent, I'm from up north there, and we have one concern. It's about Arctis and what's going on there right now, the North Pole and uh, evolution up there. Is it technology or just politics that plays around there? I, Professor Manson, those two are directly connected, mm. technology and natural resources. Mm. And when you look at the Arctic region uh, and coming from a country like Sweden, as you do, this is of great concern for so many reasons. It's of concern because there are environmental degradation concerns. It's of concern because who are these countries who are starting to navigate the previously unnavigable waters of the Arctic region. What are they doing and what is their end game? The Arctic region is full, as you know, of vast natural resources that um, malign actors are looking to exploit. If you think about uh, an area like Greenland, which has enormous mineral wealth, but is belongs to Denmark. 
uh, people don't really recognize that Greenland is not an independent country, but that it's part of the Kingdom of Denmark. And there are efforts underway to uh, extract valuable minerals, valuable natural resources from Greenland, from countries like the People's Republic of China or Russia. Uh, and um, diplomacy has a very important role to play in it. The United States and my own agents, my own former agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development, set up a consulate, it, consulate in Greenland, and we set up an office and deployed a staff member from USAID to help the population of Greenland develop some of its own indigenous capabilities to take advantage of the natural resources that are there, but it in a, in a responsible way that reflects the, the needs of the people who live there and not the malign interests of other powers who are looking to have a foothold. Keep in mind, too, Greenland is in North America. So when we talk about those good neighbors and good fences and the natural geography with which we're blessed in the United States, having malign neighbors in Greenland, just a short flight from the United States, is something that we also look at very closely. Thank you. Thank you. We definitely need help up there. Yeah. <laughs> As a, a social scientist who studies technology, I loved you hearing say that politics and tech are, are inseparable. I think that's wonderful. Um, I, I loved hearing you talk about the ways in which technology uh, has some of these unintended consequences that come from implicit biases or uh, systemic biases. Um, and you alluded to, of course, AI and facial recognition in, in uh, Uyghur lands occupied by China. As, and we could probably add uh, police surveillance in United States cities, soon to be perhaps uh, West Lafayette, for the ways in which uh, these technologies amplify existing biases or political persecution uh, of various kinds. I, am, I would love to hear you talk more about where you see uh, something like the Center for Tech Diplomacy uh, employing these liberal arts skills uh, to accompany the, the technological importance that you've spoken so eloquently about. That is such a great question, and that's what audience participation is all about when I'm talking about Purdue having a, uh, and Purdue students and faculty having front row seats at the startup of this Center for Tech Diplomacy. The, the thing that's very different about a place like Purdue from college campuses across the United States is that because of the presence of the very, the, the huge engineering program here across multiple colleges, there's a heavy influence in general in the curriculum on technology. And you don't want to feel left out when you're studying social sciences from those people who are making all of the incredible inventions that are going to be changing the world in the 21st century. So how do we integrate together? When I started the conversation here, I said tech and diplomacy are not two words that you generally hear lumped together. You have a circle here that's technology, and a circle here that's diplomacy, and those Venn diagrams don't overlap. We don't get intersection usually. And the idea here is we have to have that intersection. The two have to come together, and they traditionally don't. So where liberal arts majors come into play is helping to make those connections, to translate, if you will, the language of a place like Purdue with all of the technology and incredible innovation that's being discovered here to policymakers in Washington, D.C., or I, I'm not familiar with the camera system here in West Lafayette, but in state government in Indianapolis, being able to translate the criticality of that technology to our own national security. Most people who are our elected officials or appointed officials or career officials in Washington, D.C., most people are not engineers. But people who have an understanding of the technology are critical in explaining its important 
it, its importance to those policymakers. And that's where I see the Venn diagrams intersecting, and that nice sweet spot in the middle is the area for tech diplomacy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Glick, for a very um, interesting journey uh, across the world. Um, I have a question, kind of practically and pragmatically uh, speaking, about uh, interaction of, of researchers across Purdue, um, uh, but possibly at other universities as well, engaging with the Center for Tech Diplomacy. How do we um, how do we work with you to understand what specific technical needs? Um, are as they come up, um, and uh, and make sure that we are uh, that we are thinking along kind of responsible lines of implementation of our research um, globally. So that is such a good question. How how does one engage with the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue? And we have now offices here on campus and offices in Washington, D.C. Your broader question, though, uh, and I'm not a doctor. Uh, I, I haven't earned that right. Uh, Dr. Glick was my dad. So, um, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, the the um, bringing academic research into the norm of conversation has already happened because everybody is having conversations, for example, about the chip shortage. What does that mean? No one knows what a chip is. All they know is that Christmas presents are going to be delayed and uh, cars are really expensive if you can even find them in the United States. So these have become kitchen table conversations. And I know that academic researchers are very uh, tunnel focused on their research and it can be all encompassing. And, and the idea is for this center to be an avenue to bring light onto those academic research efforts. So whether it's in uh, wireless connectivity, 5G, 6G, next generation broadband, or AI, or semis, or whatever it is, having the center here, we volunteer to be your voice of your research, and the same holds true for any academic or industrial research organization that wants to use us, to give voice to that academic uh, and industrial research that's happening and taking that to policymakers to explain why this is important for our foreign policy. Um, so it, we're, we're open for business. We're eager to engage. Uh, as Dean Chang said, we are part of the Purdue Research Foundation, which is a 501c3. This is not a, a for-profit entity. This is really with an eye toward advancing what you're doing to be used democratically and to be used to advance human freedom. Uh, thank you very much for, for a very uh, enlightening talk. Um, I want to um, kind of augment and ask a question of a potential um, operation mode for the Center for Tech Diplomacy. Uh, we actually have a um, colloquium today, the next three days, on, um, on international engineering education. And one of the keynote speakers today talked about, it's almost, almost on the other side of that, is the need for engineering engineers to engage in these debates about the value, right? of technology to society. And we don't do that in engineering education. We tend to feel technology is neutral and we'll leave the debate to others. Mm -hmm. But I think from your talk today is we can't leave that to others. We have to engage in that discussion. And I think it will be a great opportunity for Purdue using the center as a vehicle or as a, as a playground, if you would, to engage the technology side of the campus 
and the social science side of the campus into this debate about what's the value and what's the ethic of technology, I think that will be a great contribution to Purdue, especially uh, selfishly to engineering. So just a comment. I appreciate the comment tremendously because that is 100% correct. And it goes to, to Dean Weinstein's comment about um, that kind of tunnel vision of researchers and uh, research almost for the sake of research. And research is too important to leave it in the sandbox. Research has to see the light of day, and it has to be uh, highlighted, not just through intellectual property, but through deployment. And part of this is around uh, talking, as you said, and I, I wish I had heard the lecture today because I'm in complete agreement that the fruits of those technological undertakings and the engineering genius have to be explained to people who, who don't naturally see those fruits as being beneficial because it's too hard, because they didn't study engineering. But I'm going to push back on that and say whether it's too hard or not will make it understandable, will make it digestible so that you can understand enough to make reasoned decisions and to make reasoned policies for our country. And the same holds true for allied countries. Well, uh, we don't have the uh, hybrid mode of taking questions from the chat box. Uh, however, I would like to uh, uh, bring to the stage uh, Executive Associate Dean uh, Dr. Uh, Arvin Ram, who also has played a critical role in how Purdue worked with USAID and other global engagement to provide some uh, additional thoughts and to thank our distinguished lecturer. You know, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, you know, some some background to when uh, when then Deputy Administrator Glick came to Purdue. This was back in 2019. I think it was, and uh, you know, I remember uh, sitting across the table from her, and uh, uh, you know, she was summarizing at that time, you know, really the role of uh, private sector and tech in uh, your international development at the time. I took copious notes <laughs> of it after, <laughs> it was shared with uh, Mung after that. It was quite a lesson, certainly. Uh, and here we are today, uh, yet another lesson that. Uh, covers everything from cyber attacks, bio attacks, AI, corruption of internet, technology fluency, <laughs> onshore, nearshore, allied shore. I don't think I've ever, ever heard of that. <laughs> sure. um, and then uh, really taking us on a, uh, you know, really um, amazing trip around the world um, to see where this intersection happens. I just wanted to add a few. Uh, uh, Dean Chiang asked me to uh, speak to a few things we're doing in the college. Uh, on the global front uh, that, you know, really speak to how we have also grown here um, and regarding the role of technology. I wanted to uh, highlight uh, three things uh, in particular. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the role of technology and what technology means and how to deal with the right problems has been at the core of a lot of service learning uh, that we have done, whether uh, it is through uh, you know, global design teams uh, or through EPICS program. Many of those started venturing here in the last 10, 15 years already overseas, really working with communities around the world to see that impact. And so many of our students, uh, and now uh, George, you know, thanks to George, we have an office actually, actually a building in Western Kenya. So lots of our students and faculty now know about M-Pesa, um, you know, uh, some of them probably use it to make payments and transfer payments back and forth. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so that opening from a tech point of view of trying to solve problems of communities uh, is kind of built into uh, our mission. And so we've been really trying to expand that more and more. Um, a second point uh, to bring out was uh, the role of uh, tech innovation for development solutions as well. And so. Uh, in George's uh, office, uh, we have the Shaw Family Global Innovation Lab. And that's trying to, trying to set up uh, the seed for uh, you know, scaling up innovations that
that happen really at the interface of um, some of these needs, whether it's dealing with extreme poverty, um, uh, you know, how, you know, uh, maternal child health, uh, you know, water hygiene solutions, and so on. So we've got more than 20 faculty who are working with grad students, working with NGOs around the world uh, to identify what are those challenges rather than, and we're really looking at it from a, uh, a value of death of innovation point of view, where we try to see how, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges in getting innovations to scale is really, uh, are we working on the right problem? Are we working with the right partners? And so that's really where, um, the Shaw Family Lab does a lot to bring together faculty to really, uh, with NGOs on the ground, to really figure out where is that. And more often than not, it's not the need for a new innovation. More often than not, innovations exist. It's putting an existing innovation to use in a different context. That's where the magic is. And so a lot of our faculty and students are really uh, working on that side as well. And finally, uh, one of the things we're learning uh, through uh, our project LASER, which you came to uh, uh, you know, inaugurate uh, back in 2019, um, we're rel realizing that in the nuts and bolts of the development uh, world as professionals, uh, many, of the, many of whom have social science backgrounds, as you, as you pointed out, when they're working on challenges, um, on really difficult situations around the world, trying to help vulnerable communities, even if the solution is not technology, we're finding that a technology mindset, an engineering mindset, uh, knowledge of technology helps the social scientists do what they do much better. Uh, and so we're, we're discovering that at scale. Uh, and uh, thanks, to your, thanks for your support back when you were uh, at USAID. And uh, really delighted that you are here with us today. And thank you for a great speech. Thank you.